so thanks for having me, everyone, and uh, really appreciate the opportunity and uh, really appreciate your, appreciate your time. I would say my only uh, uh, regret is that uh, uh, being you know being a graduate of the school, uh, it would have been it would have been nice in normal times to have done this in person. So I am going to jump into the presentation. I'm going to start off by talking about we do because uh, value actually is a pretty broad term. It can mean different things. Um, <clears throat> there's, I, I would say value investing falls into a couple of categories. One is uh, a couple of broad categories. One is relative value and the other is absolute value. So relative value investors are those who are looking for stocks that are uh, uh, maybe less expensive compared to other stocks or less expensive compared to the markets. Um, uh, but not necessarily uh, looking at what the actual intrinsic value of the company is. Um, then, so that's relative value. And then on the other side, there's absolute value. Uh, these are terms I'm using. Absolute value is where we're actually looking at, okay, what is this company actually worth? Uh, and what can we buy it for? And then in the world of, uh, in the category of absolute value, I would say there, there's subcategories there too. And uh, they're not necessarily right or wrong, they're just different. And, uh, you know, so there's more of what I would call the asset-based, some might use the term deep value, where uh, you're looking for situations and, and, you know, this goes back to more of the Ben Graham kind of uh, tradition uh, where you're looking at, you know, even possibly liquidation value, of a company and situations where, uh, for whatever reason, the company's trading at uh, at, uh, at, a, uh, at a price that's a bargain compared to that. Um, our approach uh, is what I term fundamental value, which is we're more interested in companies uh, valuing them uh, on a going concern basis uh, and uh, uh, looking for companies that have the right attributes that we believe are wealth compounders. So companies just through their business activities and, and their inherent level of profitability, we expect to, to generate, uh, continue to generate wealth uh, and compound it for uh, their shareholders, their share, shareholders being us and our clients. Um, the, the, uh, the perspective is really important. And again, on the side of, of, of absolute value, uh, whether it's fundamental value or whether it's uh, uh, asset-based value, uh, you know, we always take the perspective that you know we're investing in companies. Uh, we're not investing in uh, uh, markets. We're not buying. Uh, you know, we're not speculating on numbers of, on a screen. We're actually buying pieces of companies. Uh, I didn't come up with this. This is all you know, Ben Graham chapters eight and twenty kind of stuff. Um, <clears throat> But we're focused on buying the right kind of companies at the right price. And I'll talk about what the right companies are what, from our perspective and, and, and uh, you know, what we consider, what we're looking for, and also the, the kind of valuation metrics that we uh, like to look at. Um, Long-term focus, again, is very uh, key to our kind of value investing because uh, if we have a situation where uh, a company is... Uh, available at an attractive price, and maybe for whatever reason it's been overlooked or it's being undervalued or the sector is out of favor or whatever, um, we, we, we don't know when the price is going to come around. And, uh, and uh, we have to not get, uh, uh, it, it's very important to, to keep the eye on the proper ball, which for us is, is long-term returns, not what the market's doing in the short term. Uh, for us, we always uh, like to think it's it's really the difference between investing, pure investing, as opposed to uh, speculating. Um, so really, in a nutshell, our, our approach to investing in equity. So when I use the term screening, I could be talking about a literal screen where we're looking for ideas and we run different uh, uh, search criteria through databases and that kind of stuff and see what pops up and Usually a bunch of stuff does, and then you read through the names and you realize it's you know cheap for a reason and you're not interested in owning it. Uh, uh, but sometimes something interesting does, ideas do come up. But it could also mean that ideas that have come to us in other ways, it's as simple as just reading the business press, for example, or even 
having BNN or uh, CNBC on in the morning and hearing about some stock that's uh, you know been out of favor and getting getting hit or whatever, and that that'll bring our attention to it. But ultimately, if we're looking at any company, uh, we we stick to very strict criteria. Um, each criteria again is has a lot of leeway in, in latitude and and uh, it's open to interpretation. But we make sure that you know anything we buy kind of meets these general criteria. Um, and uh, um, really, obviously, we don't want expensive stocks. So we're not looking for quote unquote cheap cheap stocks per se. But we call ourselves value investor because value investors because we're looking at the intrinsic value and want to make sure the price we pay is at least reasonable compared to uh, a reasonable uh, a reasonable estimate of intrinsic value. Uh, balance sheets are really important. Uh, our approach is very much focused on uh, protection of capital. In fact, not losing money is, is pretty much an equal uh, uh, criteria along with the making money. Uh, you've heard the Buffett quote before, you know, the rule number one, don't lose money. Rule number two, don't forget rule number one. And I would say it's really, it's a lot easier to grow clients' uh, capital if you don't lose it in the first place. Um, so those first two criteria are not that kind of difficult to initially, you know, take a first pass through. And then we get into to more esoteric stuff. Now, we're really looking for, as I said, you know, companies that are creating uh, shareholder wealth. Uh, companies that are, are uh, what I call, uh, we'd like to call compounders, wealth compounders. And, and that means a number of things. Obviously, they have to be managed properly. And uh, by that, mean, we mean, you know, management that's focused on the right, you know, on the, obviously, you know, competent and honest, but also focused on the right sort of uh, uh, criteria and the right kind of goals. Uh, uh, you know, not growth for the sake of growth, but, uh, you know, intelligent uh, growth, growth. That is going to increase wealth for shareholders. Uh, we we you know do kind of you know like a SWOT analysis, uh, uh, still drawing on business school Michael Porter kind of uh, SWOT analysis of you know what does a company do, how do they do it, their products and services, you know who are the end markets for that, what's going on with the end markets, um, do they have a do they have a they don't have to be the biggest company, but they we have to feel they have a defensible competitive position. Um, and then we get, you know, deeper into, okay, well, the, let's look deeper into the actual, you know, cash flow dynamics of this company, because we've all seen examples where uh, if you just focused on the earnings and EPS, that doesn't always tell the whole story. And uh, we want to get a good feeling for, you know, what the actual free cash flows look like uh, and uh, profitability. Um, Profitability is key. You've already heard me use the word compounding a few times, wealth compounding, shareholders' wealth. Well, what does that mean? Um, you know, one of, the, one of the most important lessons I think I learned at Ivy uh, was in second year, uh, one of our finance courses uh, taught by uh, Professor Dave Shaw, who I'm very grateful for this on this, about this. Um, this entire course in second year was focused on the principles of uh, EVA, uh, economic value added. Uh, for a while, that was a real sort of buzz term, but the principles are, are still there, sound and solid. If you were going to write one thing down in this talk today, I would I would write down the site for this book. Uh, it's called Quest for Value, and it's written by an individual named G. Bennett Stewart. And that book formed the basis of this course. And it's interesting because the focus in the book is actually it's not for investors. It was written for corporate management. And it's really the whole, the whole focus of this thesis is that, okay, what should corporate management be focused on at the end of the day? Um, you know, is it growth for the sake of growth? No. We've seen lots of examples of companies that have destroyed shareholders' wealth because they, they grew for the sake of growth and therefore they went into unprofitable business lines or maybe took on too much debt or <clears throat> spent way too much money on, on high profile acquisitions that didn't work out. Uh, but really at the end of the day, a company, a job of corporate management is to earn a proper, uh, sufficient return on capital, on capital invested. And if a company 
is earning a sufficient return on capital. It's creating wealth for the shareholders. If it isn't, it's destroying wealth. Very few companies are neutral that way. Um, and that's what whole, this whole book was about. But at the end of the day, what, what does that mean for us? So because we want companies that we believe are creating shareholders' wealth and compounding shareholders' wealth with the confidence that if we buy them at the right price, then time's on our side. And you know maybe it'll take quite a while for the market to, uh, to recognize the value. And that's fine uh, because we've got the... Uh, uh, we've got the privilege of being patient, uh, but, but but you know as long as you know the company is doing the right thing, maintaining the right level of profitability, and doing smart things with the capital, whether it's intelligently reinvesting or doing share buybacks, but only if the shares are at the right price, or paying dividends if they don't you know have the right, or paying down debt. Uh, as long as they're, you know, and those are the kind of things we're looking for, what, what a company is doing. So basically, we're looking for companies, ultimately, that are creating shareholders, older wealth, that are strong companies with good balance sheets, favorable long-term prospects that uh, we believe are available at advantageous prices. Okay, so valuation. So this is always a big question, right? So theoretically and and practically i mean ultimately our valuations are ultimately based on uh, a dcf uh we're looking at going concern earnings based valuation as opposed to uh uh asset based liquidation kind of uh, scenarios but what's really important to i always uh, remind people it, it it's not it's not a mechanical process it's not uh you know there's as much art as there is uh, science, right? It's not a matter of just taking, you know, numbers, plugging them in, and and ta-da! Here's here's the uh, result. Here's what it works. It takes, uh, uh, you know, a lot of judgment, a lot, you know, a lot of finessing. These are things that come with uh, time. And uh, but, you know, on the valuation side, the point I always make, and you know, this isn't my quote. I don't remember who to attribute it to, but when I heard this, it really resonated with me a number of years ago. It could have been Munger or someone like that. But basically, in this kind of investing and doing evaluation, the goal isn't precision. It's accuracy. And that might sound odd. Like, what am I talking about? Well, precision is, and I've seen this in the real world. I've seen this working, you know, uh, uh, you know, in talking over the years with other value investors. And um, you know, an effective value investor is one who says, okay, listen, depending on these different criteria and these different assumptions, and we all know on a DCF, you can tweak the slightest assumption, it can make a big difference in valuation. And uh, um, lots of examples where uh, people put in a ton of work and come up with a, what they think is a precise number, uh, you know, $75. Because I've heard it. Yeah, I think my DCF, you know, my DCF is seventy-five dollars, and you know, if it gets anywhere to seventy-five dollars or, or less, I'll buy it. But there's no margin of safety in there, right? And you've heard that term many too many times. So our goal is accuracy. It's not saying, look, I, you know, we think this stock is worth X dollars on a hypothetical or theoretical DCF basis because we know there's so many factors. Uh, but um, <clears throat> But, you know, if we come up with a range and say, look, it could be worth anywhere from 65 to $90, and we know if we pay $90 for it, you know, we could be in trouble, we could be overpaying. Uh, but if we pay $65 for it, uh, we're probably going to be okay. And so by accuracy, I, I, I don't mean let's exactly, you know, let's figure out what the exact value is because no one can know. By accuracy, I mean, let's make sure we pay a price where, and, and we make mistakes too, obviously, but the goal is to pay a price, to try to pay a price where, we, we have, where, where it will turn out that the company was not worth less than what we paid. And that's the difference between accuracy and precision. So we build in uh, margin safety. Again, uh, that term is interpreted differently. So we build it in, first of all, 
our the consumptions we use for you know future cash flow growth and there's and again you guys done this stuff inside and out i'm sure uh in, in your program and you understand there's different ways to look at things you can be very specific for a period of time and do multi-stage and and gear it down and terminal growth rate and all that kind of stuff and in any one of those assumptions we're very conservative uh we're also very conservative in our discount rate and there's different ways of doing discount rate, and I'm not saying one's wrong or one or another, but but we kind of do it differently. So rather than using a cap M and uh, a weighted cost of sort of you know a WAC kind of uh, uh, um, approach, uh, we actually use our discount rate as a hurdle rate. So i.e., you know, if, if we target look, we want to get 10% in annual at least an annual 10% return on this uh, over, you know, the horizon time on, on this holding. So we've done, we do our conservative uh, cash flow uh, forecast, and then we use a 10% discount rate. Now that sounds high to a lot of people. Uh, but then again, we're not looking, once we use that discount rate, we're not using, we're not looking for that 30% discount between the intrinsic value calculation and the stock price, because we've built our margin safety into the conservativeness uh, of our of our assumptions. So again, we're not going to base our price on kind of the, the mid range of assumptions. We're going to base it on the lower end of assumptions, and uh, that's what drives our value, our price target. And then we feel like if you know if we stick to that discipline. Um, we're keeping our uh, our downside risk low, uh, and we have meaningful upside potential, and that's the ultimate uh, that's the ultimate uh, goal, right? Uh, both on a portfolio basis, but on a holding by holding basis, you want to feel confident going into a position that. I mean, there's always risk because you never know what's going to happen with anything, with any company, with any economy, with anything. But we want to feel comfortable that the the risk of the downside on the downside is low. Uh, the risk is, or the potential on the upside is meaningful and, and well, well outweighs, uh, well outweighs the downside. <clears throat> this is a, uh, this is a slide I like to use. I mean, I, I we do it for presentations to, uh, with advisors and prospects and that sort of thing. Um, so you know what it means, but I, I just, I, I like to throw it in here because it's just a good kind of, uh, um, Kind of graphical representations, it's very simplistic, and I just noticed there's also a, a, a spelling mistake in there. So, uh, bonus points to anyone who's watched spelling mistake. But anyways, um, but the way I explain I explain this to to uh, clients and advisors we deal with and that sort of thing that you know marketing situations is if you take a private company and let's say the private company is doing the things we like. Uh, it's it's it, it's and uh, uh, it's 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 got no stock price. This is private, so there's no stock price to look at. And <clears throat> so you had that company uh, for whatever reason, uh, various reasons, and you brought the accountants in once a year, and they did an evaluation, and um, you plotted that uh, those valuations out over many years. And again, it was a company that was creating shareholders' wealth and growing. So that line might look like that dark blue line, but now you take that exact same company and you make it a public company, you list it. And uh, as you probably already know, taking this course, the market price can look very different from time to time from the uh, intrinsic value, the actual intrinsic value. And as value investors, again, this is an exaggerated, uh, exaggerated uh, 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 Graph graphic here, but you know we're looking for situations where uh, you know we're at least at or below the the intrinsic value line in terms of market price. But just as importantly, we want to avoid the glamour stocks, right? And 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 again, so so being a value investor, being disciplined about pricing, being disciplined about valuation, that's that 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 gives you that anchor, right? It gives you that psychological uh, intellectual anchor. To not get caught up in, uh, and we all know what we're talking about, glamour stocks, right? Uh, stocks where it's got legs behind them. There's, for whatever reason, the sector, the company, the uh, the entire market's uh, 
got momentum. And uh, I'm going to talk a few slides down more about uh, investor psychology, but the forces of market psychology cause certain stocks at certain times uh, to rise in price well above what any reasonable estimate of their intrinsic value could be. And those are situations we want to avoid and stay away from. And those same market forces can often uh, uh, present bargains at times. And then those are situations we, we want to take advantage, advantage of. Um, <clears throat> we're big believers in portfolio concentration. I'm sure you've seen this, uh, something similar to this graph before. Uh, I didn't come up with it. Uh, I didn't do this study. But uh, so I'm sure you've seen this graph before. But uh, we're big believers in portfolio concentration. Uh, we don't want to own any more than uh, our core portfolio that we run uh, covers uh, Canadian stocks and a U.S. allocation and a non-North American allocation. And we want to cover the whole thing with no, no more than about 30 stocks. And uh, that really runs counter to conventional uh, thinking in the institutional world, in the mutual fund world, uh, where diversification is pushed. Uh, but, you know, as a risk management tool, uh, you know, studies have shown many times that uh, obviously if you have, you know, the more stocks you add to a portfolio, uh, the lower its volatility will be. Uh, but studies have shown time and again that that graph kind of flattens out once you get to about 30 odd stocks. Um, and I would actually go further to say that over diversification um, actually has negative uh, consequences because if you think back to uh, the slide I had earlier with our investment criteria about you know balance sheets and companies that are inherently profitable and good management doing rational capital allocation all that good stuff all of those criteria that we look at to help enhance returns uh, have the dual effect of reducing portfolio risk. But if you own 100 stocks, or if you're closet indexing and you, you know someone owns 100 odd stocks or more in a portfolio, in fact, I would argue that that portfolio is probably riskier than the well-chosen concentrated portfolio of 30 stocks. Because when you have 100, 150 stocks, uh, most of the time you're you're going to own. It's going to include stocks that are highly overvalued or companies with really bad balance sheets or companies that aren't particularly. Uh, uh, particularly uh, well run or profitable. So, um, I, I again, I, you, you know, it's interesting. And what's interesting is that, and I was talking with some of your uh, classmates uh, earlier today when they're doing an interview for your uh, the Valley Investing newsletter. And what's interesting, this journey that a lot of people go on that I went on uh, from market theory to real world. Uh, you're all very lucky because you're taking this class in that you're, you're, you've got an accelerated path along this, that, that most of you are going to go do the CFA. I highly recommend it. I, I have my CFA. I have a lot of respect for the institution and the designation. Uh, you know, but there's a lot in capital market theory that uh, uh, works in theory, but not in real life. And, uh, you know, the, the reality is, in theory, markets are efficient, right, in theory. And in the long term, they are fairly efficient, but, but in the short term, they're, they're, they're anything but, uh, you know, the, the capital markets. And the reason is it's not because there's uh, fraud going on or it's not because, uh, you know, people are stupid or anything like that. But it's really human psychology, market psychology. And this is the key thing, right? If you can get your head around uh, the dynamics of market psychology and um, how they cause stocks to get both overvalued and undervalued, uh, first of all, you know, you, you can help yourself by avoiding those pitfalls. Uh, but then you can, it can also help you become a very effective investor. Um, you, you know, it's interesting because uh, we were talking earlier about, you know, a lot of investors, Valley investors are not based, you know, in the major centers of Toronto or New York or London or whatever. And, and there's something about uh, 
you know, the quietness of being uh, away from those places when you're trying to do this kind of investing. And I always tell people, look, you know, I don't have any kind of secret formula here. Uh, there's nothing I'm talking about today, nothing I'm going to talk about. There's nothing I do that I invented that's proprietary to me. I certainly don't have access to any kind of special information that nobody else does. Uh, but it's really, you know, uh, the fact that I recognize the pitfalls of market psychology, I can stay away from them. And more importantly, I'm also in an environment as an independent firm uh, where I can uh, uh, invest in a contrary fashion to the markets, where I can, you know, hold companies that are, uh, you know, out of favor from time to time, where I can hold cash, significant amounts of cash when I can't find enough bargains or good opportunities, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really, if you can get your head around uh, uh, the, 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 the psychological forces that cause people to make bad investment decisions, you can avoid those. And, and that's half the battle. So this is a quote I love, especially the context of it. So Isaac Newton, and we all know the brilliant guy, Apple in the head, et cetera. And his quote is, I can calculate, quote, I can calculate the movement of stars, but not the madness of men. And, uh, I, you know, I love this because it's about how very smart people can still do very dumb things when their emotions get the best of them. And the context of this quote, and maybe you've come across it, and there's actually a bit of controversy now as to whether, uh, well, he did make the quote, but but to the degree of which he lost money. But he did lose money in the South Sea bubble, which you might have come across in your uh, investment, your value investment uh, uh, studies. And it was one of the great bubbles, right? It was, I think, the early 18th century. It was a common stock company uh, in England that... Uh, the speculative frenzy drove the share price up uh, to insane amounts that just absolutely made no sense. Uh, you know, another famous classic example was the, the tulip bulb mania. Um, <clears throat> but Isaac Newton himself, this brilliant, brilliant person, one of the great minds of all time, uh, got caught up in that and lost money. So he was a very smart person who, the, you know, emotions got the best of him and uh, caused him to lose a lot of money. So, the great motivators. So, um, so you've heard it many times, fear and greed. But you know, it's really interesting to sit and think about it and reflect on it because it is really true. It guides so much of what people do in all facets of life. Uh, but in the investment world, it's it's really profound. Uh, and so, you know, the fear is the obvious one: fear of losing. Uh, but I think the the, the fear of missing out, falling behind is also huge. We're hearing the term more and more lately, uh, fear of missing out, right? You, you've all heard it now. And uh, uh, that's, a, you know, that's a very real thing. Uh, so obviously the fear of losing, that, that'll cause people, it, 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 it creates counterintuitive behaviors, right? So if a stock's been out of favor and it's gone down, and nobody wants it, and you're sitting at it going, wow, what a bargain. Well, why doesn't anyone want it? Well, they're scared of losing money, right? And uh, uh, it's gone down, and there's other factors for that. We'll, we'll talk about that. Um, but the fear of missing out, falling behind, I mean, that is, that's huge. And then the greed factor is obvious, right? I mean, uh, people looking for fast returns, you know, there's always this desire, kind of that lottery effect. People want to make a quick buck. He's my next door neighbor. He's an idiot, but he, I'm not talking about my next door neighbor, but the hypothetical next door neighbor is a complete idiot. And he just made the 50 grand on Bitcoin. So I want in now and et cetera, et cetera. And, and it's a greed factor that makes us uh, vulnerable to, or makes people vulnerable to glamour stocks. So what else is there? So uh, short-term focus, this is huge. And I'm sure you've covered this already, uh, uh, this whole short-term versus long-term uh, thinking. But, you know, the best, uh, the best uh, one really good term I came across a few years ago uh, to describe what uh, value investors like myself do is uh, an advantage we, uh, strategy we use is, uh, or a way to describe it is time arbitrage. So again, we don't have information arbitrage or anything like that. Uh, but 
there's a time arbitrage in the sense that if you're willing to take a long-term patient view, that can give you opportunities in markets where people, and not just individual retail investors, but the advisors they deal with, and therefore the mutual fund companies that they uh, uh, that those advisors use, et cetera, et cetera. This pressure for short-term returns works its way through the entire investment industry uh, and, and causes a lot of issues. So, you know, one interesting uh, phenomenon is recency bias. So if you think back to that uh, graph I showed you, that uh, value versus glamour, and if you think of it either on the glamour side or the value side, when there's a movement of stock prices, let's say, going up, um, a lot of what drives that is if you've got a stock that's been outperforming in the last 12 months, let's say you've got it, you know, you'd never expect over a long run a stock to do uh, 20, 30% a year. But if you have a stock that's done 20, 25% a year in the last 12 months, it attracts a lot of attention because people look at, oh, look at the stock's done 25%. Let's get in because they get anchored to this recent, you know, recency bias isn't just, isn't just a, uh, a psychological phenomenon pertaining to the investment industry. It pertains to every aspect of our lives. It's, it, it, it's just a human psychological fact that people suffer from recency bias, but how it manifests itself in the investment side, uh, you know, is, is problematic because uh, it causes people to chase uh, chase returns. Um, you know, the other issue is comparing against short-term benchmarks. Uh, that that is what causes uh, the investment management industry to move towards uh, closet indexing where people are paying high fees for basically getting what they would with a, you know, with an index fund, which is why obviously passive index investing has become a lot more popular recently. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, you know, chasing returns, it, 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 you, you see it over and over again. Like the, the horse is not only out of the barn, but it's crossed the whole ranch and it's down on the, the freeway now and you're never going to see it again. And that's when people are, are uh, are want to get into a stock that's already had the big returns and now they're set up for losses. This is a, now this is a little getting a little dated. You see, I've got this uh, some little bit of data here. Um, this was a study I came across. It was obviously done a while ago, but things haven't really changed uh, in the states. Uh, some academics they, they did a study. They took uh, they found the fund the equity fund that it had the best 10 year track record at that time. This was in uh, November of 2009. And they, so it turned out to be this fund, this GGM focus fund. It had a 10 year average annualized return of 18%, which is really, really good. But because it was a unit trust fund, a uh, mutual fund, and they had uh, the, 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 the researchers had the, the data of both purchases and redemptions into the fund. Uh, and what they deduced was that during that 10-year period, even though the fund on average did 18%, the average investor in the fund lost 11%. Now, how can that be? Because uh, like any fund that typically outperforms, it didn't just track its benchmark because there's no way the index did 18% on average over a 10-year return. So, um, you know, what was happening was it, the fund would have a period of really good upside, both relative and absolute. And that's when investors would come charging into the fund, kind of at the top. And then uh, it would have a period of uh, weaker returns, again, both absolute and or relative. And then people would bail and jump to the next thing. So, uh, again, the short-term focus is recency bias. There's a perfect example of how it causes people to lose a lot of money, even if the fund itself and the managers are doing the right thing for the whole time, period of time. Uh, other psychological factors, action bias. This one's interesting because, uh, and I feel it too, because you know we, we have a we have a concentrated portfolio and we have low turnover, so we go weeks and weeks, even months without you know other than maybe some rebalancing. Uh, without making an investment decision, without buying something, without selling something, or annual turnover is very low. Um, and that takes getting used to, because you know it's the right thing, but uh, you know the idea that you, know, you need to be doing something, i.e. trading, 
uh, it's very powerful. It's, it's powerful in, in the institutional world. It's uh, uh, certainly in the retail investing world. Um, you know, and then and then you know you, you see we've seen, you know, recently there's been a resurgence. We saw it back in the late '90s, a resurgence of you know this day trading where people think that they can buy and sell into things sitting. <clears throat> sitting at home after work in their underwear and they're going to make a, a ton of money doing it. And, uh, uh, you know, that, that's all this action bias, which also ties in with the story effect, which is also another one, you know, a lot of people, well, a lot of people, first of all, aren't trained to do investment analysis. Most people aren't, uh, but you know, on the retail side, but, but also even on the institutional side, uh, a lot of investors are influenced by the stories. You can someone, you know, someone can come in and uh, pitch a good story, and you know, you combine that with the action bias, and you've got a, a portfolio manager, or broker sitting there going, you know, I need to do something for my clients, or I need to do this por- something with this portfolio. Wow, that's a really good story. Uh, let's, you know, let's jump in. Uh, and often, investment decisions are made as a result because of the attractiveness of the, of the story without really the uh, uh, underlying, uh, uh, without looking at the underlying fundamentals or in spite of the underlying fundamentals. Herd mentality is, is huge. A- again, uh, we talked about, uh, um, you know, people kind of following the crowd and stocks getting momentum on the upside. You know, obviously the the, the fear of missing out is part of that. Uh, but also, you know, the herd mentality, There's there's a real comfort in doing what everyone does it's again it's intrinsically wired into us as human beings right we needed we needed a uh, uh we need where we're group you know uh, i guess pack animals is the word we, we need we always needed to have a group around us uh to survive and and to do that you need to kind of there's always this temptation to do what the group's doing. And also there's a validation, a social validation that, well, if your buddy's buying a uh, GameStop, well, then, you know, that validates your own decision to do so. So when you tie all of these together, action by story effect, herd mentality, you know, that that's a perfect example, you know, a perfect example of how all these tie together and make, you know, causing people to make bad investment decisions is the whole GameStop. Uh, saga that we've just seen where all these people not yeah you know under the guise of we're sticking it to the system and the hedge fund guys or whatever etc it was really a combination of fear of missing out greed looks like our my friend's making a quick buck i want to get in there and make a quick buck too look we're doing something we're going we're clicking buttons action bias oh there's a great story here and everyone i know is doing it so i i should get in there and do it too uh okay so Given so all of these all of these psychological factors that that everyone is subject to, uh, again as I mentioned earlier, uh, it uh, it it um, puts pressure. It, you know, it creates a demand from the investing public that puts pressure on the on the investment industry. Very real pressures that causes uh, um, uh, that causes inefficiency in the way a lot of money is being run. I'm of the uh, of the opinion that amongst the, in the investment industry, there's too much focus by investment firms on their own business risk, as opposed as opposed to client risk. You know, again, if you take any any index fund, any passive index fund, and and uh, um, as I said, there's going to be stocks in there that expose people to a lot of risk, risky stocks. You don't have to own them. Uh, Large investment complexes are more focused on uh, their own because they have large cost base. Many of them might, you know, fixed cost bases. Might some many of them might be parts of public companies, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, they don't want to, you know, they always want to be selling something, and uh, so oftentimes there's too much focus on business on investment decisions or and investment offerings are based on managing their own business risk. Uh, again, the short-term pressures, and I'll tell you, this works its way to the people managing money, and uh, uh, it's really surprising. Uh, I, you know, I had my eyes open when I first got in the industry many years ago, um, and I only 
got into the industry because I got interested in value investing. And when I did, and I wanted to get in, into the industry, I was very, very, very lucky to find a spot where uh, uh, we were actually doing uh, patient uh, concentrated portfolio fundamental analysis kind of investing. So I'd never seen anything else. Uh, and uh, I remember uh, I was at an investment conference and I got into a conversation with someone, a very senior person in the industry, and we were talking about a stock. And uh, uh, I remember it was my eye opening, my big eye opening, because when I got in the industry, one of the things that was bothering me was if this is so obvious, this approach is so obvious, and uh, uh, then why wouldn't everyone do it? And if everyone did it, then opportunities to buy stocks at good prices wouldn't exist because it would be arbitraged out. But it, it, I remember it, early on in my career, and I'm at this investment conference, I got in conversation with a very senior person in the industry, uh, and we were talking about a stock, and which I thought was a good buy, and he he very casually said, yeah, I agree with you, but you know, it could take more than a year for the price to come around. And I kind of was surprised to hear that. My eyebrows, I guess, lifted. He caught that. And he looked at me and he said, he was surprised. He asked me, he said, do you mean you could buy a stock if you thought it would take more than a year for the price to come around? And I said, yeah. And he said, wow, like you're really lucky. So, so even people in the industry uh, who know better because they're subject to the short-term pressures, uh, you know, I look at the list of people who have presented at this, uh, uh, to this course before, and I know there's people in there on that list who, you know, stuck to their guns and wouldn't succumb to short-term pressures, um, and lost their jobs over it. Uh, that's what happens in this industry. Uh, so that's why most investment offerings out there are closet indexing, uh, there's not enough focus on effective risk management over diversification. I, I talked about that before. So what is risk? I was asked, uh, my definition of risk, uh, to discuss that. So, you know, it's, it's, it, it, it it's not about short-term volatility. It's about permanent loss of capital. Uh, and that's how I define risk. What's the risk of permanent losing capital on the position? I I don't care what the stock price might go in the next six months. If I if I have a conviction with the position I buy in, it's actually kind of weird. It's kind of perverse because if the stock keeps going down, I actually and you know I obviously want to keep on top of the story and make sure that my thesis hasn't changed. But then I'm you know I'm happy to buy more and up the position. The flip side, you know, if I buy a stock and it goes up, uh, and especially if it goes up quickly and I have to sell it, it breaks my heart which is, sounds bizarre because we made money. I, and the example I'm going to use at the end is one such situation, but it's almost, you know, we bought this company, we like this company, it's creating wealth for shareholders, for our clients, but it's gone up too much and now I have to sell it. And uh, that's almost like a, a disappointment, which sounds bizarre. But, you know, to 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 invest in a way where you're really, where you really uh, uh, can probably properly manage your risk, uh, investors need to have the appropriate time horizon, uh, and uh, or else permanent losses could be forced. So, you want to, you know, if you're investing, you have to understand that if you buy a stock today, uh, the price might go sideways for a long time. It could go down for a while before it starts going up. Uh, so, you know, if you've got money that's earmarked for a year from now, well, don't put that in stocks. Uh, because you could have permanent loss of capital if you have to pull the money out while the stock is down. But what you don't want to get in a situation is where uh, the company itself is deteriorating such that it turns out at some point in the future that the stock, the company itself is worth less than what you originally paid for it. <clears throat> that's permanent loss of capital. And, and, and that's, that's our definition of risk or how we, what we consider as risk. So for all of you, so you're all doing the right things. First of all, you're taking the right course with the right prof. You're in the right school. You have the right classmates. So you're doing, you've all made some really good choices. And uh, you all uh, have the skill set. The fact that you even got it got to the ID stage means you've you've already got like enough of a skill set and brains to be a good investor. Uh, but 
to to really be good at investor, uh, the proper mindset is everything. If you don't have the right mindset, it's going to be tough. Uh, unless you're going to work in, a, in the kind of investing uh, operation that I <clears throat> that I don't you know that I don't agree with. But if you want to be a good value investor, you really have to have the proper mindset. A few snippets here, uh, uh, you know what goes into that. First of all, it's really important is to focus on the process versus the results. The results are out of your control. If you do the right things, if you make the right decisions, the long-term results should work in your pro, in your uh, favor, investment results. But the short-term results, there's a lot of randomness. And, and this has to do with decisions of what you buy and also decisions about what you don't buy, right? So you could buy something today and six you know, a year from now, the price hasn't gone anywhere or it's gone down. Uh, and but that's a short-term result. But what matters is the process and sticking with the process. And as long as your process, decision process was good, uh, that's you know that's what matters. And the flip flip side goes for for not buying things, right? Like if you take a pass on something for the right reasons, uh, you know, stock is very overvalued, or you know, it doesn't have good fundamentals, or whatever. And the, and, and the stock goes on a, on a speculative uh, upswing uh, and six months later, it's doubled or whatever. You can't beat yourself up over that because again, as long as you're, pro- you're confident your process was right, uh, then it doesn't mean your decision was wrong, even though your friends are telling you, Hey, you idiot, you didn't buy Bitcoin at uh, 5,000 and uh, look at it now. That doesn't mean, if, if you chose to pass, that doesn't, the fact that it's gone up, whatever, 10 times or whatever, it doesn't mean that it was a bad process. It was, and it's a process and decision. And that's what's in your control, right? Only the process and your ongoing day to day process, that's what's in your control. The results, the short term results, the medium term results are not in your control. So you can't let those get to you or else that's when you start getting, that's a slippery slope to getting into all those other, uh, all those other uh, psychological traps. So just keep focused on the process. Uh, as you cross train your brain, and I'll tell you why, when you get into this field, it's, it's very, it can be very immersive and you can spend all of your time uh, you know, reading financial statements and you know, thinking about investments, but, but you know, you, you know, your brain is like, uh, you know, the other muscles of your body. You have to, uh, you can't, you, you know, you, you can overwork it, uh, certain parts of it. <laughs> and uh, so you really need to cross train it. You always want to, you know, develop other, you know, and if you have a, you know, most of you, you're well-rounded people uh, and uh, you probably have had other interests and hobbies and that sort of thing. And, you know, whether it's reading or playing the piano or golfing or whatever, like don't lose those hobbies. Your brain, your brain doesn't have to take a break, but it has to take a break from investing and thinking about investing and uh, to keep your, your mindset healthy. Um, That doesn't mean you have to take off, uh, you know, weeks, weeks at a time and sit on a beach either, but it just means, you know, you know, give yourself, your brain some time off from the investing side and use it for other things. And, 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 uh, that'll help you. Um, and then, you know, the emotions, like become more self-aware. We've talked about how emotions can cause bad investment decisions and poor investment performance. And, uh, you know, uh, spend time thinking about that, thinking about these factors, thinking about, you know, if you're, if you're, anxious about an investment decision. Well, why? Is it because you're not confident in your analysis or because everyone else thinks something different, so you must be missing something? Uh, And again, that whole process versus results, you know, you know, as long as you, you, you stay true to your process, uh, the results will come. Uh, You just have to give them time. Um, And, but if you can monitor and manage your emotions uh, in the investing world, uh, you're miles ahead, miles ahead. 
so here's an example. I was asked to give an example. Um, TJX company. So this is a company that runs in the States, the uh, TJ Maxx stores. And in Canada, they run the uh, winner's chain. Um, this is a company I have uh, admired and watched for a long, 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 long time. Uh, and it's always been too expensive. And, uh, you know, every time I come back to it, uh, you know, and over the years, they just keep doing the right thing. Uh, terrific company, well run, great business model. We'll talk about it a bit. Uh, and uh, it's never been able to own it. It's been too expensive. Last year, about a year ago, basically, last March, during the COVID sell off, uh, I was very busy, you know, scouring the markets for, uh, you know, potential buys. And one of the things about being in the business after long enough, you you start building, you know, you, again, I was, as I said earlier, you run screens and whatnot, but you also start to develop a, just kind of a mental database of companies that you've seen and come across and studied and admired, et cetera, and that you might want to own at the right price. And, and uh, so it was a very busy time. <clears throat> In that quarter, because things were, you know, the markets were set, were down, and uh, a lot of stocks were down, and there was a lot of time spent, you know, very busily looking at a uh, number of stocks, including a company like TGX, which I've always wanted to own, and now kind of had a hard look at it, and uh, came to the decision that no, now is the time to buy. So, um, why did it sell off? Well, the market sold off, but retailers. Uh, got hit particularly hard uh, because as we know, the Amazons of the world, et cetera, uh, gained market share, you know, online shopping expected to be, you know, expected to increase. And it certainly did. Um, and all the retailers got hit hard, but, and some, and many rightly so. But the thing about TJX companies is, uh, you know, their business model is, uh, you know, the, the, what they offer and the price, they offer their merchandise at and the shopping experience is something you can't replicate online. Not just the, not just the tactile experience of going in the store and looking around, et cetera, but the price points that they offer stuff at, uh, in, in, uh, it would be very hard to do online. TJX has been doing this for a long, long time. And they've got a massive, you know, they've got something like, I don't know, four or 5,000 stores. They've got a mat, you know, one of their key success factors is their merchandising is their buying ability. Not only, you know, the number of people they have out there negotiating with the manufacturers for ex manufacturers and other distributors for excess inventory and that sort of thing. Uh, <clears throat> but, uh, um, uh, you know, so, so, but which the, the price they can buy and the price they can sell for and still make a good margin uh, is very hard for online uh, 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 vendors to replicate. Uh, because typically when you go online, you're looking for something specific, whereas you go to a TJ Maxx store or a winter store kind of with the idea, you're going to look around and see if there's something you like. And if you like it, you know that it's going to be a, at a really good price. Um, <clears throat> so, the stock did sell off and, and, but, you know, we, we don't just buy because the stock has gone down again, you've got to put in the work. So obviously COVID, the COVID situation was going to affect its profitability for a period of time. Um, we, we factor that into our scenario analysis. Uh, and also, you know, we did some serious stress testing. It was like, you know, these stores could be closed for a while. Can they survive? Uh, well, and, and we did different scenarios there that, you know, can they, can they survive a reasonable period of time without going insolvent? And, and, and that's important. That's where strong balance sheets come in. So we came to the conclusion that, you know, it's probably worth about, uh, intrinsically, uh, we were comfortable at about 50 bucks a share. Uh, and we were able to start getting in at, at a little under 40, um, now, again, this is a good example of the kind of company, you know, we buy it for clients. Um, it, it, it's, it's a wealth compounder. Um, again, you know, a wide mode company, well-run, good balance sheet, 
that's a wealth compounder, good uh, internal uh, profitability. And so we'd be happy to own it for a long time. Because as I say, you know, we don't make, I was trying to explain this to clients and prospects and advisors, we don't make money by trading it out of stocks, right? We make money by buying the right companies that are creating wealth. And then we let those companies create the wealth for our clients. So this is a good example. TJX is that kind of company. Uh, but within two months, it went up, uh, you know, over 20% and went past kind of uh, uh, the intrinsic value, kind of the comfort level. Uh, and uh, so the stock, you know, we ended up s- selling in about two months, which was, again, it was tough. You, you put in all that work and you liked the company and you waited for years to own it and you buy it. And even though uh, we made very good, a very good return on it, especially if you analyzed it, uh, annualized it, sorry, because 10, you know, 20% over two months is, is not so bad, but it was, it's rather bittersweet. But anyway, it was a good buy decision. So here's, here's something for you all to ponder. So we sold it at $53 and I guess that would, would have been April or May last year. And at 53 bucks, it had gone past our kind of comfort level of, you know, range of intrinsic value. It's run up significantly since then, right? I think it's been as high as around 70 bucks now. Right now, it's kind of sitting, I think, somewhere in the low 60s. So ask yourself. uh, It was obviously a good buy decision. Uh, Was it a good sell decision? Uh, Back to what I was saying earlier, process versus results. Well, it was the right process. It was the right decision to sell it when we did. Uh, But boy, when it keeps going up after we sell it, you can sure feel like that decision. Uh, so that's it for my formal presentation and slides. And uh, so I guess what I will do here is I'll get off the screen share. Now, just one one quick uh, point. Um, um, you mentioned earlier about um, precision versus accuracy. Yeah. Um, so the first person who said this actually, was uh, Enrico Fermi. Enrico Fermi was the mathematician behind the atom bomb. And what actually he said was, it's better to be approximately right than precisely wrong. Okay. And uh, I think this is what, in value investing, we we think the same thing. We prefer to be approximately right as opposed to precisely wrong. (laughs) Yeah. Okay, so Harrison. Hi, Herdev. Thank you so much for coming to speak to us. Um, given your experience investing in both the Canadian and the U.S. markets, I was wondering if uh, there were any uh, differences in, in what success means for a company and a management team between the two countries. Uh, no, I think, you know, ultimately the principles are the same uh, in terms of what management should be focused on and 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 goals and and objectives and that sort of thing and uh, um, yeah I don't see a big difference I mean obviously Canadian companies are generally going to be you know on, on smaller you know not necessarily all of them are in a limited market I mean we have some terrific companies that obviously compete globally or even a company like Canadian National Rail that you know it's one of the top uh, rail networks in in North America you know uh, competing up against the you know, the big U.S. firms, but uh, uh, no, I you know you know that that the interesting question. It's a fair question. I it's not something I've, I guess I've really thought about. Um, the one thing I will tell you is, a value investor, it is very hard to be focused just on the Canadian market uh, because the the in normal times the the, the uh, just just it's a it's a smaller pond to fish out of. Uh, hi, Harder. Thank you so much for those interesting insights on behavior and, uh, you know, uh, mindset of an value investor. Uh, my question, I just have two questions. Uh, first is around value investors always looking for a mispricing opportunity. And uh, let's say tomorrow all the shares go down. How do you think about doubling down on existing investments versus uh, trying to invest into new companies? And my second question is around... Yeah. Uh, uh, sorry, my second question is around uh, investing in financial services and insurance companies. Yeah, I see that you invest like majority of your stocks, around thirty-three percent in in these companies. Yep. How do you think about uh, 
investing in these companies because you know, analyzing these companies are quite difficult. Banks, yes. it's quite difficult, yes. Yeah, no, good question. So um, the first question about doubling down is, so first of all, you know, the, the typical process is you bought something, price goes down. So that brings some anxiety because, of course, you know, you think, well, have I missed something? Uh, but you sit down and you do your work and you, uh, uh, and most of the time, if your process is right, you're going to have the confidence to, to increase your weighting. And it's a very good feeling, <laughs> right? Because if you like the box of cornflakes at $2, you're going to like it even more at a dollar, unless it turns out it was stale and rotten, but let's assume it wasn't because you opened up the box and had a look. Uh, and uh, no, I, I absolutely, I mean, our, uh, um, you know, we're dynamic in our, our weightings and, you know, whatever our initial weighting was, if we continue to study a stock and, you know, oftentimes we've, we've been catching it on a downward trend uh, in terms of market sentiment. So quite often it does continue going down after we buy it. And uh, that gives us time to kind of fine tune our, our thinking on it and, and uh, uh yeah, we will very often, uh, we, we we actually like those opportunities if we can buy more just because the prices come down further. Did I get both your questions there? Or? No. Oh, insurance companies, right. Um, so insurance companies are, are, you're right, we have a lot. Uh, obviously, we have an over-weighting, uh, you know, obviously, uh, um, there's a couple of reasons for it. Uh, you know, Fairfax and Ber Berkshire, which are two companies that I admire very much. Uh, I don't know if you can see in the back of my wall, but actually that picture is of me and Warren Buffett. And that picture is me and Prem Watson. But I don't know if you can see it from where you are in any event. Uh, but that's not the reason to own the companies, obviously. But they have, been, I've not always owned them. But for the last while, they've been both trading at decent prices. Uh, that we, you know, feel is going to give us a very, very good return. Um, and uh, generally speaking, you mentioned financials. So you're right. We do seem to be, we're probably as weighted in them as I'd ever want to be. Uh, partly is because in Canada, uh, obviously we have an overweighting in, in financial services anyway, but plus I don't particularly like resource-based stocks. Uh, plus financials is where, you know, the, the opportunities have, have been uh, for the last while, and you know, uh, you know, as you know, we have, we have Power Corp and uh, uh, the Great West Life or the Canada Life franchise now, and uh, uh, very powerful. And uh, Manual Life has been. Uh, we didn't always own it, but at, uh, uh, once we got kind of our head around the uh, um, their mitigation efforts they've made over the years. Um, <clears throat> against that exposure they've got in the States that they bought with John Hancock to very variable annuity uh, uh, policies uh, that hurt them very bad in the last uh, um, uh, financial crisis. Once we got the comfort that, you know, they had their kind of the, the, some controls around that, uh, we were comfortable getting into that one. And, uh, you, you know, there's different ways to value an insurance company, but at the end of the day, if you're getting an insurance company where you feel confident that they're good at underwriting, they're, they're, they're strict at underwriting, uh, um, and if you can buy it for less than one and a half times book, uh, you know, you're probably going to do quite well. That number comes from, you know, I you know, we've done different, because again, it's hard to know, right, <laughs> with an insurance company. But, you know, we've done model different scenarios. We say, well, you know, what if they only grew their book by this much and, you know, their return on assets was this much, et cetera, et cetera. And then we, you know, ultimately came up with a range of the well-run insurance companies, you know, theoretically should be worth, you know, anywhere is up to, you know, whatever it is, 1.7, 1.9, two times book kind of thing. So if you can buy it, at, you know, under one, one and a half, 1.4 times book that these companies have been at, uh, we feel... Uh, uh, will do well. But that's, again, one of our things are approach right now that we are over, overweighted in uh, financial. But that means doesn't mean we always are or always will be. And again, that's one of the things about an, uh, kind of taking an, uh, an independent approach where we don't have to look like the market, right? There's no institutional imperative that's saying, listen, you're 
you're way overvalued in financials. You can't do that. You're, you're, you, you don't own any resources. You can't do that, et cetera, et cetera, right? Like we don't have those constraints. So as long as we, you know, we're doing the work and have the confidence and, and, and that, you know, our downside is managed, uh, uh, we're okay with uh, being overweighted in any, in any given sector at any given time. Thank you so much. I heard that. Uh, just, I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more about the way you calculate the discount rate. Um, so you mentioned you use use it more as a hurdle rate, and you said ten percent. Now, is yeah. that ten percent? Is that uh, like a, a tried and true? That's always your benchmark, or do you kind of change that up depending on the company? And if so, how do you determine that uh, that amount? No, we basically just use uh, use ten percent because I look at it as like as I was saying, I look at it as a hurdle rate, right? So, uh, um, yeah, it's a different way of looking at it. It's a different way of looking at it. Yeah, but when the rate is at one percent, I guess, and if one rate is ten percent, then you have to have this discount rate. Right? This has to change depending on what the market conditions are, right? Because you cannot well, have a ten percent when the when the RF is ten percent, as opposed to when the RF is one percent, right? Yeah. But again, it's a different way, right? Because one way is to say, let's do a whack way to cost capital. Uh, and and there's just, it's just different ways of doing it, right? I'm not saying one's wrong, one's, one's right, one's wrong. But you can take a theoretical whack, uh, apply that rate, which those whacks are going to be lower than 10% these days, obviously. And no, I mean, but like, like you, you put and, a bar of safety, I guess, on the expected return you have. Right. But the expected expect return should change depending on what the risk free rate is. So if the risk free rate is 1%, 10% is okay. But when the risk free rate, like back in 1980, when the risk free rate was 20%, oh. you wouldn't be happy with 10%, right? Oh, you that's different. You're right. You're right. Yeah. You're right. We would use a higher one in those cases, but yeah. I don't want to use lower than 10%, I guess, is, yeah. is the, uh, yeah, fair enough. Yeah. So um, my question is, uh, you know, like in the intelligent investor, people always go like, oh, this time it will be different. And then, like when stuff hits the fan, it's not that different. Like stocks crash, bonds go up. But this time, do you think it's different going forward? Because like the the banks are printing so much money. Mm. Yeah. You say different in terms of uh, like interest rates and right? bonds being inversely correlated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I guess I'd never really thought of that, uh, but certainly. You know, if we get into a situation of rising interest rates, uh, it, yeah, it's going to hurt both. It's going to hurt all asset classes, right? You know, bonds are going to come down as a result of market value anyway, except for you know, we're, we're keeping our bonds very, very short duration. Uh, you know, I think real estates and infrastructure and all of these things are going to get. Uh, 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 but uh, at some point, but uh, who knows what and when and how much, right? So like what? So with the principle of like twenty eighty, uh, like twenty percent bonds, eighty percent stocks, would that still work, or is Benjamin Graham stuff too outdated? Yeah, that's a good question because in fact, you know, like, like my own experience with this book is the first time I read it, most of the book I was like, what? And a lot of it is outdated. That's why we always talk about the two chapters, eight and twenty, right? So you know, kind of that bond, that mix, uh, it really depends on. Uh, uh on who the investor is right so you know uh you know i i, I chair a, a, a pension committee for a school for example and so i've got a window on you know on on, on that on you know with the with, with the defined benefit pensions you do you you get the actuaries and they do very detailed every number of years of asset liability matching study and so your your asset mix there is really liability driven uh, but I think even individuals, it's, it's, it really depends on <clears throat> not just their age, but sort of what their uh, what their both their emotional risk tolerance is, and but also uh, what their time horizon is for the money. So someone like you starting a, at some point at TIFs or RSP or whatever, uh, and that money is for thirty years. Well, of course you should be one hundred percent equities, uh, and if you and if you personally wouldn't feel comfortable at this stage in your life with the volatility that would come with 100% equities uh, allocation, then uh, maybe uh, uh, like I would be surprised. Now, keep in mind that we're also, our, our equity allocation 
uh, isn't static, right? So, so um, in our equity allocation right now, we have a lot of cash. So, you know, from a client perspective, we would say you know, a new client comes on and okay, Mr. Joe Blow, when you're 60 years old, and you're going to start pulling this money out when, whenever, and your risk profile is this, so we're going to make you 70, 30, right? But 70 equity, 70% equities, 30% uh, um, <clears throat> 30 uh, uh, fixed income. But that 70% equity, th that itself can be static because now most investors don't do this because when they have an equity uh, mandate, they're fully invested, but we're not, right? So our equity mandate can fluctuate uh, when markets have run up. And I've, if you think back to that, graph with the value and glamour, right? If a uh, number of stocks that we uh, own can turn into glamour stocks and we sell them, and then we've got this cash and what do we buy next? But if markets are high and we can't find anything, we hold back and we'll say, well, I'm okay with letting cash build up. So right now, our, our equity portfolio, for example, is almost 30% cash. So if you were someone who was theoretically 50-50, right? Your right now your equity, your actual, your target equity allocation is still fifty percent, but your actual equity allocation would be would, would be lower as a result. I don't know if I answered your question at all, <laughs> but I guess that that eighty twenty. I, I, I don't remember what Ben Graham actually said about that in his book, but I, I would think it's antiquated because it really depends on the uh, on a client by client, on a mandate by mandate basis. Okay, yeah, uh, yeah, thank you. That's that's really insightful. Okay, John. Yeah, uh, hi, Arlo. Thanks for the talk again. Um, I actually had a question about the investor psychology sort of concepts that you discussed during the presentation. Yeah. Um, and you spoke a lot about how it works on the sort of upside, like the, the bull, sort of overly bullish side. Would yeah. you say that like last March was almost the other way um, in terms of people being overly negative and like overly pessimistic? Um, or is that like a bad example of like how that works in the opposite? Uh, well, generally, you're absolutely right. People overreact on the upside. People overreact on the downside. The frustration with last spring was, even though there was quite a sharp uh, uh, correction, uh, I personally don't believe that markets came down. They went from pretty overvalued to more towards a fair value, but they certainly didn't become undervalued. Uh, there were certain certainly pockets of opportunity. Like I said, that's when we bought TJX company. We also bought uh, we also bought Google in that period of time, another company I'd wanted to own for a while. So certain pockets did come down either to kind of a, uh, but, it, but, but, but it, yeah, it wasn't like the markets as a whole did not become on overall uh, underpriced, but that, but that does happen. That does happen from time to time. Okay, yeah, great. That, that, that makes sense. Thank you. Um, thank you, Hard for speaking to us today. I just have a quick question about a topic that our previous speaker talked a lot about. She talked a lot about ESG investing. I'm just yeah. wondering how your thoughts on that and if you think there's a place for that in value investing. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it. I guess if you want to choose to apply those criteria, uh, there's no reason why you can't. Simple as that. Um, you know, I, I don't know because we don't. I mean, we don't generally invest. Uh, we're not going to invest in companies that are doing obviously terrible things. Uh, but nor have we we pretend to have adopted you know any kind of strict uh, ESG criteria. Again, the companies we tend to own do tend to be larger, so they tend to be under more of a microscope. And you know, it's interesting because these days when I go through, uh, you know, uh, earnings releases or annual returns of companies we own, like that's front and center now, like chairman's letter, ESG, blah, blah, blah. So they, they're all doing it. Uh, so um, I don't know if that's a good answer for your question, but I would just say if one wants, because obviously, yes, there are some investors, some funds, et cetera, that are now explicitly, uh, uh, explicitly touting ESG, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, although I would almost go to say that the danger, and I, I, I'm not saying this is a situation, but in these kind of things where there's certain criteria that become popular and rightly so, uh, oftentimes in portfolios are marketed with those criteria uh, without enough um, uh, view to uh, underlying valuation. 
right? Like in the tech days, well, tech, 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 anything with tech, let's have tech fund. Okay, who cares what's in there as long as it's tech, right? So I'm not saying that's going on with the ESG, but there's always a danger that certain uh, criteria uh, become popular uh, and can 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 be can can sometimes by some investors outweigh proper valuation. That always has to be the bedrock. Uh, Iris. Hi. Yeah. So you mentioned earlier that when you when you started your career, you started on the the value investing side. My question is, like, do you think it's valuable to, I guess, see what the other side of the market is thinking? So maybe, you know, on the trading side, growth oriented investors to kind of see what the other market uh, is kind of thinking specifically on similar names. Oh, for sure. Yeah. You always want to get different perspectives and you want to get to see what other people are thinking. And uh, um, absolutely. Yeah. And then on that to another specific question, uh, in terms of, uh, I guess, your rationale in investing in more mega cap stocks, how do you find like an, having an edge there when, you know, they're, they're quite, they're not obscure and there's quite a bit of smart money behind it as well, like in, in, in general. So like, yeah. how do you think you finding an edge there and, and like, what has been your, I guess, your success there in doing that? Yeah. Again, you know, we're not trying to shoot the lights out. Right. So yeah, if you were someone who wanted to, you know, target 20% a year. Yeah. Well, then you're not going to do that by owning, you know, larger established companies. You have to get into smaller cap and then, you know, they come with their own, uh, they come with their own uh, challenges, obviously. Uh, but, you know, our goal is to, you know, to beat our benchmark. Uh, you know, we have kind of a hurdle rate rate of about 10% annualized. And we want to do that with way lower risk than our, uh, than our, you know, than the, than the broader markets. Right. And uh, no, it, it's a great question. And that's why at any given time, we don't own most stocks, right? So if you look at, you know, the benchmark, the indices, what makes it up, we, between Canada, US and uh, the rest of the world, if we only have 30 stocks, it means most of the big stocks out there at any given time, we don't own. And that's part of the reason why we, we believe in concentration is, is for many of the reasons you just said, and it does, I'm not, we're not just talking about mega cap stocks, right? But, you know, mid cap and that sort of thing. Uh, but at any given time, most of them are, you know, properly priced or overpriced. And uh, except for certain times when, when the entire markets become undervalued and that does, and that does happen. Thank you. Hi, thank you very much for coming today. I was just wondering if we could touch a bit on, on inflation and it, how you react when there's market implied inflation. So I know like, so bonds, for example, don't offer much of a hedge. And then yeah. I know Buffett seems to suggest that equity markets don't offer much of a hedge against inflation either. So then do yeah. you look sorry, at- Sorry, uh, what, what markets? Uh, equity markets. I was just- Oh, equity markets. Buffett yeah. wrote a piece saying that he, he at least suggests that equity markets don't offer much of a hedge against inflation either. So then mm -hmm. do you- expand and look into international markets to find that kind of protection if you think it's local to a certain country or do you i mean you've talked that you don't necessarily like resource talk so yeah. do you look to find some sort of edge not really i mean if there was a specific country that was considered a high inflation country that's going to be more of a you know emerging market kind of company and country anyway and you know, we we don't we we don't invest there right uh I don't, I don't remember if we talked about this during, no, it was during the earlier interview, but we, we discussed that, right? So our approach to non-North American stocks is uh, we want, or, or North American stocks too, for that matter, we want exposure to the emerging markets. We want to participate in that growth, but the way we want to do it is to buy companies that are located, that are already very well established, uh, located and traded in developed markets, but that are doing business in the emerging markets and grow with them. Uh, I, I don't think that answered your question. I, I think I went on a tangent here. Uh, but no, really, I, I don't think, because we don't really get into the sort of, you know, macro kind of considerations. We just feel if we have a well-diversified geography, well-diversified across currencies uh, and are holding, you know, the right companies, then, uh, you know, then, then we will do well. And uh, uh, so what could we do against inflation? And, you know, that, that's a tough question. I can tell you on the bond side, as I said, we're keeping duration very short. 
Uh, we've certainly given up a bit of yield, but uh, we'd rather not have our investors lose, you know, a crap load of principal because we decided to go in the long bonds for a little bit of extra yield. Uh, but on on the uh, on the equity side, I mean, ultimately, uh, on the equity side, I mean, inflation does work its way through. And in fact, if you've got a company that's already now, I'm really getting into kind of hypothetical stuff here, so because uh, uh, I'm just kind of BSing you, I guess, because <laughs> it's not something we think about a lot. But so I'm musing, not BSing, musing. Um, uh, you know, if you, frankly, a company that's got a that's got any every kind of company's got debt, right? So companies we own have you know debt on their balance sheets. If you have inflation, in theory, their balance sheets getting stronger, right? <clears throat> because their asset values are going up. So I don't know if that answers anything. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's good. I, I hadn't thought about that. Maybe you gave me something to think about. Uh, hi, Hardev. Uh, thank you so much for your time today uh, and a great presentation. Uh, I have a couple of questions for you. I wanted to ask about your fund. So are you uh, taking in institutional money or is it more of a wealth management space? Uh, and secondly, like, how do you judge the management? Are you uh, in touch with them? Are you sort of like meeting them on, on, on a regular basis for the company that you invest in? And third, you know, you did talk about the short term uh, and how, you know, portfolio managers are uh, almost like threatened. You know, they could, they could get fired. So in terms of candidates who, who are interested in working within a value fund, uh, like what recommendation you have for them? Like what are they, you know, I guess – if there's not a lot of value funds in big cities such as Toronto um, yeah. or Montreal, Vancouver, uh, what are some of the, uh, I guess, recommendations you have for them uh, that yeah. they should be doing? Thank okay. you. What was the first question? Yeah. So the first question was like the uh, the kind of uh, funds that you're taking in. Is it right, institutional? Right, right, right. Okay. Yeah. No. Or, yeah. So we have some uh, quasi-institutional money in the sense that we are a sub-advisor for another firm, but they, but they, but their offering is, is a, uh, uh, so the strict institutional, like the pension funds, that kind of stuff, we're, we're not in that space. So we have uh, our main uh, source of assets. We do take on direct clients. We're larger. Uh, we work uh, with uh, medium-sized clients through, we've got a network of financial advisors that we uh, do a kind of a referral business with because we only do asset management, right? We don't do financial planning and that sort of thing. So, uh, we work with the independent advisors on that. Uh, and then we also have a, uh, uh, and some of those advisors use the fund. Uh, some of them, uh, uh, it's a direct, uh, larger clients, direct referral. Uh, and then we do have one uh, set of quasi-institutional mandate in that it's a, it's a, <clears throat> it's a sub-advisory mandate, uh, but that firm's offering is a, is a, uh, a, retail, a retail offering. Okay, that was question number one. What was question number two? Uh, secondly, I wanted to I, I wanted to talk about uh, or I wanted to ask you about the management. Like, how do you right. sort of like do you speak with them? Do you uh, sort of meet them? Like, how do you judge them? So, sort of. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I there was a time earlier in my career uh, where, uh, especially you know, would go to. There used to be more of them, particularly in states, the investment conferences where the buy side, sell side would bring in a bunch of companies and then they invite the sell side and you could do Q&A and that sort of thing. Um, and I, I found over time, and, and you can always call the companies, but I found over time, you know, if you're dealing with larger companies, et cetera, there's a lot of transparency as a management. Uh, really, if you, if you, um, you know, go in and spend time with management and come out thinking, okay, well, now I know a lot about them. Uh, there's a bit of fallacy to that because it's kind of hard to know. So if, if someone, because if someone wants to fool you, they <laughs> they can, and we've seen it over and over again. So basically, you know, with larger companies, again, there's, there's enough transparency these days that we obviously don't want to get in situations where, you know, there's obvious information that, you know, the individual has checkered history and this or that, et cetera. Uh, we certainly, uh, um, I'm certainly interested in, you know, we'll, we'll listen to conference calls and I'm more interested in not the canned remark portion, but the Q and a portion. 
because I want to hear how they're answering questions. It's not so much what the answer is, but how do they respond to tough questions and, and, and that sort of thing. And uh, um, so I, I think what you're talking about is, is, is really more important when you're dealing with small cap companies where there isn't that kind of broader level of, uh, of knowledge out there in, 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 in terms of reputation and that sort of thing. And then we, you know, but we do, we, we look at management, we also look at, we want to see what do they do? You know, when they make decisions, why did they make them? What was their rationale? Do we think they're rational capital allocators? Okay, do we think that they're making decisions that make sense for the investors in terms of building their wealth, as opposed to trying to prop up the short-term share price? Uh, or trying to build up their revenues at the expense of profitability in order to build up their size of their fiefdoms and their their comp structures. That so we do look at those things, uh, but it doesn't require you know any kind of you know actual one on one conversation with the uh, with the management. And did you have one more question in there? Uh, yeah, just lastly, I wanted to ask uh, about sort of like the short term uh, focus oh, for, yeah. for a lot of the portfolio managers and. Uh, Sort of, yeah. uh, you know, values dying, and 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 some of those uh, long-term funds are sort of not in 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 bigger cities. What recommendation do you have for for I guess candidates who are interested in that kind of investing? Um, well, I mean, there there are big value investment firms in big cities, but here's the reality. And and again, I was I was uh, saying this earlier. Uh, I can't remember if it was in this presentation or with the earlier group with the interview. But here's the reality: like if 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 value investing makes sense to you, if it resonates with you and you want to pursue that as a career, then, then go for it. I encourage you. Uh, but I also say you have to be patient in the sense that it'll take you a while. It'll probably take you a while to get into it. Not because you're not good enough or smart enough or anything like that, but it's simply because a lot of people want to get in, you know, onto the buy side generally. Uh, but when you focus on value investing firms, then it's even a smaller, uh, uh, smaller universe, a way smaller universe. And you know, one of the the, the advantages, but to the business, but disadvantage to young people is that um, you know, unlike other areas of finance, investment banking, whatever, you got a whole bunch of people come into a firm in any given year, a whole bunch of people go out of the firm in any given year, uh, and they're constantly replenishing. Uh, in in portfolio management firms, generally. Uh, you know, there are not a lot of seats because they're very scalable businesses and the seats don't, so the seats don't come empty very often, right? There's not a lot of turnover. So I don't say all this to discourage you. I say it to warn you to not get discouraged because initially you're going to go out and you're going to talk to the firms and I get lots of resumes, lots of people I would hire in a minute if I needed someone, but you know, in our business, you don't, need a lot of people and, and spots don't open up a lot and you're going to have to be patient and creative and uh, uh, but do things in the meantime that'll help you you can still develop the skill set first of all you know first of all you know find any kind of job where you're doing any kind of financial analysis or any kind of business analysis or even just working for a reputable company where you are demonstrating the ability to go in and you know, be a useful employee and be a reliable employee. And at the same time, you're getting your CFA, et cetera. And, uh, you know, but specifically, if it's anything to do with financial analysis, whether you're in a corporate treasury department or commercial lending or, 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 or uh, uh, um, you know, those, because people understand, right? Like if you've got an opening and the right person walks in and, yeah, I'm four years out of school and I've been studying value investing. No one's going to hold it against you. The fact that you've been doing something else for the four years, as long as it's something that's at all useful. And the other advice is, you know, if you want to be a value investor, um, again, you're not studying markets, you're studying business businesses. So, so, and again, you, you're all, you guys, you're all already coming from a good spot where you're at, you know, being at Ivy, uh, um, in terms of learning how to learn about businesses, learning how to learn about, and can always do that. Just continue doing that, right? And then you can follow your own stocks. You don't need to come up with your own value ideas, right? To see what other value 
investors are doing. Look at their portfolios. You can get that information easily. Mutual funds, all kinds of disclosure, 13 apps, all that sort of business. And um, uh, look at what they're holding. And and don't just go, oh, they own that. That's a value stock. But actually dive in. It's all there now, right? You can go online. You can pull off very easily all the you know financial statements, all that sort of stuff. Watch uh, uh, presentations and earnings calls and that kind of stuff. And there's nothing stopping you from from you know doing your own work and just keep doing it. And if you have the passion and you put in the effort and and you know and 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 eventually you know if you want to do value investing, you will eventually do it. Uh, but it could take it could take time. Awesome. Uh, thanks so much for the presentation here. I think my question is just a matter, and you hit a bunch of uh, behavioral biases during, but just a matter of how you avoid like the hindsight bias. So. Looking back on some of your decisions, maybe realizing at the time you didn't know what to do, but it worked out amazingly, or maybe the flip side and how you kind of like keep adapting. Again, it's just, first of all, accepting the fact that you can't uh, uh, always know everything in any given time. Uh, just as long as you were comfortable and you were true to yourself about the process, right? So if, if, if you know, if you, if you make an investment and it turns out to be a bad one, but if you were confident that you were true to the process, you put in the work, uh, well, then you're just going to learn something uh, by have, making that mistake anyway. And that's going to help you the next time around, right? So, uh, you, you, you know, we're talking about hindsight. So, uh, uh, never, I would say the, the, the biggest regrets are... Uh, so an act of omission where you didn't buy something, right? So there's lots of times where an idea comes to you or you hear about it and you look at it or whatever, and you take a pass because it just, you just, it just didn't, you didn't get it. You didn't uh, feel uh, you understood it enough and you took a pass and then the price goes up. Don't beat yourself up over those because it's very important to stay within your own circle of competence. Right. And uh, now the, the ones that I do beat myself up over and it, it happens less and less because one of my lessons is you come across an idea, it looks interesting, you do some work, you do some more work, and then you do too much work, right? You keep trying to fine tune, you forget that it's accuracy, not precision. You start going for that precision, precision, you take too long, and then the price shoots up on you, it goes away on you, and then you start trying to chase it. And that's a that's a bad thing. So, you know. But being able to kind of go to that, okay, I can't know 100% of everything because nobody can. So I'm not going to shoot for 100%, but with the margin of safety and the company, et cetera, and if I can get to 75% or whatever, the number, you know, it's, it's not real numbers I'm talking about, but, you know, kind of emotionally or whatever that, okay, I know enough and it takes time to kind of have the wisdom and confidence to do that. Uh, but if you get to that stage, th then you got to act because that's what you can fairly beat yourself up over is, you did enough work, it made sense, it didn't act, and then the price went up. Uh, but that takes time too. You, know, you learn that lesson, you know, no one's going to ignore the stock forever <laughs> if it's a good one. Okay, so we're out of time. So I'll ask you the last question that I always do. Uh, and this is, um, what is the most important thing you learned in life and investing yep. over your professional life? I think it's the same thing I was just kind of talking about is that whether it's life or uh, investing or whatever, uh, you as long you have to you have to be true to your process and be diligent about your process, whether that process is how you invest or how you're going to treat people, you know, or or how you're going to enter or what kind of life you want to build for yourself, right? As long as you're true to yourself and you're true to your process, then, you know, you can be accepting of the results because the results aren't always going to be what you want it, whether it's your career, whether it's your investments, whether it's, you know, your relationships or whatever. Uh, but as long as you have kind of a grounding, a proper grounding, and, you know, so I'm not going to talk about what's a proper grounding for, for uh, uh, you know, relationships and, and uh, that sort of thing. But what we talked about here is what I believe to be a proper grounding for investments. So, so uh, as long as you, 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 uh, you're true to yourself and you stick with it, 
then you have to accept the fact that there's randomness to the results. And, and, and that goes for your career as well, right? So there's always going to be people who are just as talented as you, just as smart, just as hardworking, who uh, just by luck, you know, got a few steps ahead or whatever, and that snowballed. And, uh, uh, you know, but as long as, you know, you're comfortable with what you've done, as long as you're comfortable with the efforts you've made, uh, at any given point in your life, in your career, you're at where you're you're at. And uh, uh, if you've been doing the right things, just keep doing them and be happy with it. If it turns out you're doing the wrong things, reassess and, and uh, you know, shift course a bit. And there's a lot of investors who started off on the wrong side, <laughs> learned their lessons the hard way and became, you know, good value investors. So thanks again. And uh, hopefully next time you can come in person and talk to us. I'll look forward to that. Okay. I'll look forward to that. And good luck to everybody. Thank you. Good night.